Something happened yesterday which I would like to talk about. I don't know whether you're keeping up with the news or not, and I'm not suggesting it, certainly not suggesting it. But one of the, maybe one of the two or three top leaders of Hamas was assassinated yesterday in Tehran, in Tehran City. Um, he was there for the inauguration of the new president of Iran, who constantly reassured his people that his position in Israel is no different from his predecessor. Israel has to be destroyed. Every Israeli has to be killed, every wiped out. Um, so this was the head of heads of Hamas who was there to participate and honor the new uh, president of Iran. And uh, he, of course, was living in Qatar, life of luxury and, and enjoyment. And he traveled to Iran as a dignitary, you know, import, important international figure. And somebody blew him up. Somebody killed him with a missile. I can't imagine who. You could probably exercise your imagination to think of alternatives. Now the question is, how should we feel about that? And introduction to the question is, how should we feel about anything? And the general answer to that question obviously is the way Kodesh Baruch would want us to feel about it. And what looks like the key to that is let's see how Kodesh Baruch feels about it. And then if we know how Kodesh Baruch feels about it, then we'll know how we should feel about it. I don't think that train of reasoning is entirely correct, as I will show you. But let's start by taking it step by step. I want to give you two examples of where things can happen to you and the very natural feeling to have. And then when you stop and ask, how does it look to Kodesh Baruch Hu, you think, maybe I'm not maybe I'm missing the boat. Here's a simple made-up example. Um, I say I've decided to work on my hospitality as a mitzvah. I made my mind Friday nights. I'll look around and see if there's any person in school that I don't know. And if there is, I'm going to offer hospitality. That's my new mitzvah. And there it is Friday night, and I'm sitting in shul, and then just as this baruch starts, there he is in the corner. Ah, my man. Definitely not part of our community. There's my mitzvah. Fine. The davening's over. I get up out of my seat to walk over to the corner. But Ruvain is two steps ahead of me. And looks like he's walking over to the corner. Couldn't be that Ruvain's going to offer him hospitality. And I hear Ruvain saying, uh, are you not from here? Do you need a place to stay? And he says, oh, thank you for asking. Yes, I do need a place to stay. And they walk off together. And how do I feel? He stole my mitzvah. Look at that. I was prepared and he took it away from me. And I lost the mitzvah. That's how I feel. Now, if I stop and ask, how does the Kodesh Baruch Hu feel? Well, the stranger got hospitality. And Reuven got a mitzvah. And I get credit for the mitzvah because I wanted to do it. It's a win-win-win situation from Kodesh Baruch Hu's point of view. And I'm angry. Well, then there's something wrong with being angry. I'm out of touch. That's, you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Regarding the concept that you're not allowed to steal other people's mitzvah, so apparently the reward is not the same, I don't know. Like, you could answer that question. What's the answer? I, you know, like, you, you said, you will anyway get the reward for doing the mitzvah. Listen to what you're asking. Steal my mitzvah. Why was it my mitzvah? Did I make a kinyan on it? Was it in my pocket? My bank account? What makes it my mitzvah? I wanted to do it. That doesn't give me rights to it. I have to have, if I got there first and he pushed me out of the way, that would be stealing my mitzvah. 
But here he got there first. Well, now you, I see, you are switching ground now. Before you were asking about stealing my mitzvah, have we given that up? Not, uh, not in that particular case. And like the guy was like not aware that he's stealing someone else's mitzvah. He's not, he's not stealing my mitzvah. It's not mine. Why is it mine? Yeah, it's not yours. But for example, if you were a signer, then I'll like drop some George. But that, but now you're going to a different case with a different with a different point. The point now is is in this case, he's not stealing my mitzvah at all. So, in other cases, if he steals, there's actually a penalty. I saw it's a hoover. First of all, it, it, if it's my mitzvah, he's taking something that I wanted to do, number one. But number two, the, um, you know, for example, the, the idea of being my mitzvah is when I have a son and it's a question of his bris milah, it's my mitzvah. And somebody who I just tried to do a milah steps in, does it before me, he's stolen my mitzvah. That's definitely mine. It's not his. Um, but um, the truth is that when we talk about the, say, the reward, the, um, I'm speaking quoting in our show now, uh, the reward is something you get in the next world. But when you do a mitzvah, there are other consequences to the mitzvah other than reward. And one is that when you do a mitzvah, it protects you. And number two, when you do, an, when you do a mitzvah, it enables you to do another mitzvah. And those are, are consequences in this world, and they aren't associated with that idea of reward. That idea of reward is only in the, in, in the world to come. Okay, but, um, th yeah. On that, if someone was to want to do the mitzvah, and someone gets it first, and there's real world repercussions doing that mitzvah, like a new film character or something like that, is it, is it reasonable to assume that he will, like, he's not going to get that, those other uh, benefits? That, I'm not, what I'm saying is this. The one who actually physically performs the mitzvah gets the benefits both of reward in the next world and consequences in this world because he actually did the mitzvah. The one who wanted to do it and was prevented by circumstances against his control will get recognition in the world to come but won't get the, but won't get the effects of it because the effects of it are effects from actually performing it, not just wanting to do it. So it makes a difference. But when you look at the two people who want to do the mitzvah, it doesn't belong to either of them. So the one who gets there first, he's the one who gets to do it. In the temple, there used to be competition for certain mitzvahs. The mitzvah of cleaning off the altar of yesterday's ashes, Truos Adeshin, at one time, they used to have a race, a race up the ramp, and whoever got to the top first was the one who did it. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Okay, so now, let's see, go back where, to where we were. Yes, so um, I, I felt that I, I, I felt that I lost out, but I didn't lose out. First of all, I didn't lose anything that was mine, and from a Kodesh Baruch's point of view, the world is now in an ideal state. Nothing wrong with it at all. According from a Kodesh Baruch's point of view, it couldn't be improved. So if I feel devastated when the situation couldn't be improved, I'm out of touch. That's one example. Another example is this. One division between commandments, there are many divisions, but one division is this. Some commandments you are obligated to do. Because Baruch says, I command you to do this. If you do it, you'll be rewarded. If you don't do it, you'll be punished. Other mitzvot, because Baruch says, I invite you to do this. If you do it, you'll be rewarded. But if you don't do it, I don't mind. You can omit it without any penalty. The first is called Mitzvah Osa, commanded and done. The other is Eina Mitzvah Osa, Not commanded, but he does it anyway. He's not required to do it. Now, if I ask, which mitzvah would you think is the more precious, the more important, deserving of more reward, the more profound, the more spiritual? So... In my experience of asking this question, those who haven't been trained, don't have a good Jewish background, unanimously say the one that you're not commanded to do is definitely a better mitzvah. It shows your, your commitment, your generosity, uh, your nobility that you want to do the best, the best that could possibly be done. If you do what you're commanded to do, then maybe you're obedient 
you're respectful, you're um, responsible, but not that's not the same as being noble and self-sacrificing and generous. That's the normal, natural, intuitive response. But the Torah sources tell us the exact opposite. The exact opposite. What you are commanded to do, and you do, is more precious, more important, higher reward, more spiritual, than what you volunteer to do. So, when you hear that, again, the reaction should be, aha, uh -huh, so I'm off track. If I thought category A is superior, Torah says category B is superior, I'm off track. I have to try to find out why the Torah has a judgment different from what I would have expected. And there are two answers in the, in the commentaries that I know of. One is the answer of Tesis, who says the following, that this Tesis, written 800 years ago, is as contemporary as this moment. When you are or ordered to do something, commanded to do something, there's a natural resistance. Don't tell me what to do. Don't push me around. Don't take over my life. Even when it's coming from the Creator, there's a resistance to being commanded what to do. And since there's a resistance, it's harder to do. You have to overcome the resistance. We have a general rule. The harder you have to work to do the mitzvah, the more reward you get for it. So according to Tosis, it's a simple psychological explanation. Another explanation found in the Ritva and the Maharal, and maybe others that I don't know, um, is this. Ask yourself, in which of the two categories is there more of me? And in which of the two categories is there less of me? Let's take the one where I'm only invited to do the mitzvah. Why am I doing it? Because it's the noble thing to do. It's the, it's the essential thing to do. It's something which will create a certain per perfection. It's something which, which uh, expresses my generosity, my idealism. You hear a lot of I and me there, my idealism, my generosity, my nobility. There's a lot of self-expression in the one which is voluntary. The one which is commanded, which is obligated, there's a submission to a higher reality, that that reality is more important than I am, and therefore it creates an obligation that I should do it. There's much less of me. And the spiritually higher performance is the one in which there's much less of me. Where I'm expressing myself, if part of the purpose of the action is to express my character and my virtues, then it's, to a certain extent, a self-centered self action. Or it's less self-centered if I'm doing it in recognition of an external reality which obligates me. In fact, the Ritva, who says this, he says it in a very poignant way. The more important the mitzvah is the voluntary one. And he says, now, of course, the voluntary one, let me, I'm sorry, I said it backwards, let me say it again. The more important the mitzvah is the obligatory one the one where God commands. The voluntary one, says the Ritva, it does express your generosity. It does express your commitment. It does express your inspiration. It does. And therefore, it's also, also important. It also has value, but not as much value as the first category. So the, the Ritva takes explicit account of the nobility in the, in the, in the, in the voluntary mitzvah and says... That qualifies it for some recognition, but not as much as the one that, that, uh, that's strictly obedient. So then, this sort of changes your picture. Where am I holding? What am I trying to achieve and accomplish? What are my goals? And calls into question the, this shows me to be generous. This shows me to be high-minded. This shows me to be noble, which I think is a significant amount of a person's normal motivation. How do I look when I do this? I think that's a normal thing to think about. And then now to realize, well, maybe I have to go higher than that, that normal motivation to look for something, something more him and less me. Uh, maybe the most dramatic expression of this is Moses' relationship to God. 
you, you may have heard the expression that God spoke to him mouth to mouth, pel pe. Some of the commentaries ask, he spoke to him mouth to mouth? Um, shouldn't that be mouth to ear? <laughs> when A is speaking to B, the words come out of A's mouth and they go into B's ear. What do you mean mouth to mouth? We're not talking about speaking back and forth. We're not talking about conversation. Although God and Moses did have conversations, but that's not what we're talking about. So the oral tradition tells us that God's voice spoke through Moses' throat. That means Moses became like a megaphone. The megaphone has no effect on the words at all. The speaker creates the words, and the fact that it goes to the megaphone doesn't change the words at all. That's the highest thing that a person can hope for. That, in the words of the Tanya, he, you become a receptacle for God's will, and you simply carry out God's will. A lavush is one way, one way it's put. So when you hear that, you think, well, then I have to readjust my feelings, readjust my perspective, and see you know, what, how, how, I should, how I should learn to look at the circumstances. OK, now, this is background for those who came in late. Um, we're talking now about having an attitude towards the elimination of one of the highest members of the leadership of, of Hamas, <coughs> who was assassinated in Tehran yesterday. How should we look at it? Now, I think one natural response is he's our enemy. It's a good thing he's dead. Another natural response is hooray for the IDF. I mean, they haven't officially taken credit for it, but everybody's, some people are giving them credit, and some people are blaming them for it. Everybody agrees that they did it. A missile hit him in Tehran. Pretty dramatic. Doesn't that show you that Iran can't protect itself from a missile strike in its capital city? I don't think they look very good. Doesn't it tell you that Israel knew where he was? How did Israel know where he was? They must have some inside information. Does that mean that the leaders of Iran also are un under the, you know, bakavenet, as you say in Hebrew? They're in the, the, um, look, the, Range finder of the, you know, the, of the, of the, of the rifle? Yeah, it does. Hooray for the IDF, you know? They're doing very well. They can, they can pull that off. Uh, those are natural responses. Is that the way the creator's looking at it? And is that the way we should look at it? So let me introduce you to a couple of reflections, which will show you, I hope, that this is a, a not, a, not a simple question. The Jew, the, to, at the parting of the Red Sea, where the Jews are crossing and the Egyptians are drowning, the Midrash tells us, maybe you've heard this, it's pretty popular, that the angels wanted to sing God's praises for the event. And God said to them, my creatures are drowning in the sea, and you're singing my praises? And commanded them to be silent. Who are my creatures who are drowning in the sea? The Egyptians. Jews weren't drowning in the sea. Jews were going across on dry land. So God says to the angels, you can't sing my praises because my creatures, the Egyptians, are drowning in the sea. Which means, from a certain political point of view, this is absolute gold. Right? It means that God cares about the Egyptians also, and the loss of the Egyptians is a loss, and that loss has to be registered. But then, what was our reaction when the Egyptians were drowning in the sea? There's something that you say every morning, if you dive, dive in, in the mornings. The song of the sea. That's all about the drowning of the Egyptians, the destruction of the Egyptians. 
There are one, two, one or two brief hints that the Jews are being saved, but 90% of it is the Egyptians are being destroyed. So the question arises, if God cares about the um, drowning of the Egyptians and tells the angels to be quiet, how come we were able to sing God's praises? Does the fact that the Egyptians are being drowned stop praise or doesn't it? And a hint of the answer comes from a Gomorrah because the Gomorrah recounts a similar situation when Ahav, the wicked king, died. And the Jews of that generation wanted to give praise because he was a terribly evil person, terribly evil king. And the objection that the Gemara has raised, what about what about my creatures are working my hands and surrounding the river? Here, it was a Jew who was being killed. Ahab was a, kid, was a Jew. So you think, if God has a distaste for praise when Egyptians are being drowned, surely he would have a distaste for praise when a, a Jew is being killed, even though he was wicked. And there the Gemara says, but there's another verse. Uh, there's a verse, well, there are two verses. One verse is, Bin pol al tismach, when your enemy falls, don't rejoice. And another verse that says, Babod Rina, when the wicked are destroyed, there's joy. So if you pay a little attention, you begin to hear a difference. When my enemy falls, I shouldn't rejoice. Because what am I expressing when I rejoice when my enemy falls? I'm expressing my hatred for my enemy. Well, don't do that. But when a wicked person falls, is destroyed, then I can express joy. There is joy and allowed to express it. And the subtle problem arises when he's the same person. What happens when he is my enemy and also wicked? What do I do then? And the answer has to be that I have to choose the dimension in which I relate to him. If I relate to him on the dimension of my enemy, then I better keep my mouth shut. If I relate to him on the dimension of being wicked, if I put aside my personal account with him, put aside my personal feelings against him, and think of him only as wicked, then rejoicing is perfectly appropriate. Now, what's God's con 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 condition in this, in this circumstance? Well, the Gemara says that even in the case of Achav, the wicked Jewish king, when he is destroyed, God has a certain loss. And he registered that loss. So now what you're seeing is, from God's point of view, there are two different reactions. One is that he's God's creature. And a loss of God's creature means, at a certain extent, that creature doesn't fulfill the purpose it otherwise would have had. That means the creation as a whole isn't ideal. So there is a certain loss from God's point of view. And of course, if it actually happens, there has to be a gain also, otherwise it wouldn't happen. But it means from God's point of view, there's an ambivalence. And now we're being told that from God's point of view, there's an ambivalence, but we don't have to be ambivalent. We can rejoice if we see that dimension as it looks from God's point of view, which causes rejoicing. And that is that a wicked person is destroyed. That wickedness coming, being taken out of the world is something which makes the world a better place. So when we look at someone like the fellow who was assassinated or the terrorists who were captured, who well, once were killed, and the ones who were captured, we look at them and we see them either destroyed or suffering. Either way, if we look at them through the lens of what 
role, what effect are they having on God's world? And we see them as wicked, which they certainly are. And then we say, it's good that they should be killed, or it's good that they should be imprisoned, or good that they should suffer. That's appropriate. But that requires a, a kind of spiritual exercise of focusing on the impact that they have on God's world and God's purposes for the world, what God wants to happen in the world, and subtracting from it my own personal feeling of, of uh, anger and animosity and hatred for the things they've done which hurt me. They hurt me, yeah. Yes, uh, it is true that the, well, they don't have anger. It's a little tricky. I'm not sure what to say about the emotions of, uh, of angels. But the, uh, the, the answer there, see if this, how directly this relates to what I'm saying. The answer there that I heard from Rabbi Meisel, which I think is a very deep answer, is this. When you say shira, which is what they said, shira is a kind of prophetic poetry. The Song of the Sea. By the way, S-O-N-G in English, in our literature, like in Old English, doesn't mean music. It means poetry. Shira, shir in Hebrew mean poetry. That's why when you say the Psalms and you say Mizmor Shir, Mizmor means music and Shir means poetry and it means either it's poetry put to music or it's word put to, word to, to, words put to music. Uh, words for the music, and uh, Shira is the poetry. So this idea of this, this kind of poetry which registers such a great event has two aspects. One aspect is praise, and the other aspect is gratitude. And the difference between us and the angels is that for the angels it's only praise. Not, they weren't in any danger. They weren't saved from any danger. Nothing, you know, not, they don't get any benefit out of the fact that it happened. So their shira would be just praise. Since we, our, we were saved, our lives were saved through this event, when we say shira, it's both praise and thanksgiving. And the fact that my creatures are uh, drowning in the sea cancels out praise, but it doesn't cancel out thanksgiving. And with that difference, my Rabbi Meisen discuss, uh, explains about five different details of practice, which I'm not going to go through now because it's not my subject today. But, uh, but that's, the di that's the difference over there. Um, yeah? Uh, when looking at the difference between enemy and wicked, to me it seems, it seems very clear that enemy is, is a personal thing, like I define it for myself, whether this person or this entity is an enemy. Uh, but wickedness seems like more of an abstract idea that's more in, in concept of, of the world or in, uh, of the world as a whole and everybody as a whole. When you're looking at wickedness, should you look from the, your own perspective or should you be looking, maybe, maybe their wicked actions are not wicked to them and, and so then how, how do you relate whether something is wicked or not? Okay, there's, uh, this bears what we spoke about yesterday. This is an interesting question. There's a difference between action and agent. Judging an action is one thing, and judging the agent who performed the action is another thing. Uh, a person could do something totally by accident, which is very destructive. In that case, I would just pity the, a the agent. He had an accident and it happened to, happened to hurt the He wasn't irresponsible. He certainly didn't plan it. So then I would have no judgment of the agent at all. If the agent does it, um, because he was misled, because he has bad information, not only wouldn't I necessarily hate him or blame him, I might even praise him. Uh, 200 years ago, medical practice was based on false ideas about health, and very responsible doctors did things that actually hurt their patients, and they deserved nothing but praise, because they were using the best information that they had. So when it comes to Judging the agent, other things have to be taken into account. What were his goals in doing it? 
uh, were the good goals or bad goals. And among bad goals, there are better and worse goals. Um, and this becomes now very important because you've understood the distinction between my enemy and wicked. I think that, that, that distinction is clear. But now they sort of go hand in hand. Suppose he's wicked because he's my enemy. That's what makes him wicked. Because let's say I'm doing something that's good. And his wickedness is going to stop me from doing something that's good. Then it's precisely the fact that he's my enemy that makes him wicked. And that's specifically true, the, there are sources that talk about this, that's specifically true of people who hate Jews. They might hate Jews for a variety of reasons. But some of them hate Jews because of what they stand for. Their place in the world. What they're trying to achieve in the world. And then, hating Jews that way is going to be what makes them wicked. So, for example, um, there was, I'm trying to remember if there's a direct quote from um, Hitler or not, or one of the other Nazis who said that the Jews crippled mankind by foisting upon them, pushing upon them a moral conscience. And that's just, uh, going back to Nietzsche, that's, that's just a, 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 a crippling, false shackling of the human spirit, which rises to glory and conquest and you know, the rest of the rhetoric that they, that they went through. In other words, he did it as a, as a, as a revolt against moral restraint. That's really wicked. That's, you know, pretty high up there on the scale of being wicked. Doesn't matter if we kill people because no one can tell us what to do. That wasn't what all they all said, and I have other things to say about that. I'm not talking about the Nazis now, but that's that's what, and if you have people who understand the religious dynamics of the world and oppose the Jewish place in it, then that could be even worse. Um, we just had a few weeks ago. The king of Moab was upset when he saw the Jewish people approaching his kingdom. And he says, I want to make sure that I can just chase him out of the area. That guy shut him in orders. He hires Bilam to create a curse and so on and so on. What is his goal? Just stay away. Stay away. Why is that his goal? You know, he's hiring this guy who can curse people, who has a reputation. When he curses people, they're cursed. So why didn't they hire them to kill him? They should die. So the Shem Yishmuel, one of the Hasidic commentators, says something very deep. He says, Moab wasn't afraid that we were going to conquer him. We were forbidden to conquer him. Moab didn't want the Jewish people to go into the land of Israel because when we go into the land of Israel and we live natural existence, we live according to the laws of nature, we are going to take the natural world and infuse it with a spirituality so that someone who wants to live like a slightly smarter squirrel, courtesy of evolutionary theory, you know, human animal and non-human animal, you're just an animal that's different from other animals, but you're not an animal like the rest of them, he's going to find no satisfaction in a purely physical life because the Spiritual underpinnings are going to be are going to come to the surface. So he, so the king of Moab said, just stay in the wilderness and live with your miracles, eat manna, and have the clouds of glory protecting you, and have a nice existence. Stay there. I'm not against you. I don't want you out of the world. Just don't disturb my world. Don't disturb my world. That's really opposing God. That's opposing God's purposes in the world. And by the way, there's a beautiful, a beautiful expression of this which a student here pointed out to me 20 years ago. We're going through Megillus Esther, the book of, book of Esther. There, I told him that when in the book it says the king without mentioning his name, it refers both to Ahasuerus, the flesh and blood king, and also to God. And it says that at a certain point, Haman comes out of the palace, he just had a banquet with the king and queen, and Mordechai doesn't bow to him, comes home, he assembles his 
family and his, and his friends, and he says to them, my life is worthless, nothing, empty. I have nothing of value. Nothing of value? You're prime minister. You're very rich. Everyone has to bow down to you because the king said so. You have a multitude of children, including 10 sons. You have a palace. Nothing's worth anything to you? How could that be? It's because Mordechai doesn't bow down. Mordechai doesn't bow down. Nothing's worth anything to me. Isn't that a little exaggerated, you know? I mean, the psychologist would be very interested to interview this guy and try to figure him out. Yeah, because it says, when I see Mordechai, who's sitting at the king's gate, the student said to me, Rabbi, you told us that when it says the king without a name, it refers both to Achashverosh and to the creator. When Haman sees that Mordechai is sitting at the gate of the creator, all of his physical success means nothing to him because it's outclassed. He knows it's outclassed. That's what bothers him. What bothers him is that Mordechai sits next to the Creator's gate, then he's opposed to what the Creator wants. He's opposed to the Creator's goals for, for the creation. That opposition to Mordechai becomes wicked. There's one more case, which uh, I think I just discovered this year. Tower of Babel. What were they doing wrong? There's a lot of literature in the oral tradition about it. Um, and one is that they're building a tower, whatever this means, to go up to heaven and fight against God. So <laughs> there's no greater um, opposition to God than that. But the Orachayim says, the Midrashim are there, and they're all genuine. But if you look just at the verses, there's a very simple explanation. It says in the verses, they built the tower and the city in order that they should all be gathered in one place, lest they be scattered all over the earth, to prevent them from being scattered all over the earth. Well, turn back a couple of chapters, and you'll see that when God created the world, he said, pru urvu umilu asaharetz, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So that means building the tower in the city is setting up opposition to God's plan for the universe. So that's where... The, the opposition becomes, becomes evil just because. So they're opposed to the Jewish people because of the role we play, because of what we want to bring into the world, then their hatred for us becomes evil. That hatred by its, by its definition is equal, evil. And now it's not just my enemy and God's enemy happen to be the same person, but it's in hating me. That's what makes them God's enemy. And still, I have to step out of that. I have to step out of my reaction. Here's a way to test it. Now, this is very brutal and, and exaggerated, but it's a way to test it. Imagine that you weren't Jewish. Would you feel the same outrage as to what they're doing against the Jewish people? Because you believe in God and you know what the score is, you know what, what the purpose is, you know what role we're playing in the world? Probably not. Probably not. But then, that's, the goal is to move in that direction as much as possible. The goal is to move in that direction as much as possible. So that you try to see this through God's eyes. And uh, what I said before, the, 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 the important implication is that the bin poloi vechal tismach, I'm sorry, that the masyadeh tov miyam, that the God's loss of his creatures, which to him is a loss, you don't have to adopt. That you don't have to adopt. That's not obvious. To me, it was surprising when I learned it. Why shouldn't I look at the world with, the, with God's eyes and see it the way he sees it? Well, the simple answer is because you're not God. So on the contrary, why should you expect that you should? OK, we should. Usually we should. Here we're being told that there's a limit on it. When the wicked are destroyed, then it's appropriate to rejoice, even though from God's point of view, there is a loss. Yeah. So two, two, two questions. Um, one, there, so there was a differentiation between enemy and wicked, but then it seems like we've come to the conclusion that if you're God's enemy, you're wicked. Correct? Oh, yes. I meant I, the distinction was between, between personally, my enemy and, and my wicked. Enemy and being wicked. That's right. Sure. <laughs> An enemy of God is going to be wicked. That's right. Exactly. And, and then when I 
when I asked the first question a, a few minutes ago, one of the points you brought up is somebody is an agent who's been misled um, and, and acts on, on misguided beliefs. And, and so I'm not sure that, uh, that Ismail Hina uh, fits, fits this description, but, but what, how would you classify the Gazans, terrorists, those, those people, when it seems very clear that they've been misled, not maybe there's a good percentage that have this core belief and, and this core knowledge that, that Jews are bad and or, or that, that they feel as though Jews are bad and that Israel's bad, but more more likely than not, they've been misled and, and so can we classify these people as wicked or should we be classifying them as our enemies? Well, I think I think it's a mixed bag. I agree with you. I think I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I think the situation is complex. First of all, for the beliefs that they have, that the Quran is true and that they, uh, that the Quran uh, uh, runs the world so and so on, they've been misled by their teachers, and I don't I don't know their society that well, but I don't see from my from what I can see any reason for them to doubt that their preachers are correct. Uh, you know, they're not all uh, educated. They're not all sophisticated. I, 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 that's one thing. Um, there's also, I think, a question of the, the modes of character that they display. Um, and there, the question would be, are they acting out of those modes of character because of the official doctrine? because that's the way they've been, they've been trained? Or is it a certain uh, ferocious animal nature which isn't in the sources and isn't, uh, isn't trained that way and uh, they just let loose? If they do that, then they don't have that excuse. There was a war between Iran and Iraq 20 years ago. By the way, both sides used poison gas. Um, we in the enlightened West don't regard that as appropriate war, war effort. Um, but I don't think that when they, on one side, conquered a city, they burned the children of the other side to death. I don't think they did that. So they burned their, they destroyed their Korans. Because since they were written by the other side, one Sunni, one Shia, right? one, so they're not, they're not holy books. I mean, so the question is whether they simply used the official ideology to excuse ferocious animal-like behavior, which wouldn't be forgivable then, um, even if they were praised for it by other people whose animal-like behavior cause them to sympathize with it, they wouldn't, they, wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be innocent of that. But yes, people who are, who are misled can do terrible things. And unless you can find in their character some flaw which led them to be misled, see, Rav Wasserman uh, asked the following question, which is very similar to what you're asking. What complaints do you have against an atheist? He doesn't believe that there's a God. Without a God, all religion is empty. Religion starts on God's commandments, God's preferences, God's plans, and so forth and so on. Without that, you have nothing. So what, what complaint can you have? If a person believes in God and doesn't do what he wants, so that's something else. So Rehonim Asuman said, and this is a general rule, you could attack him internally rather than externally. You ask, ask him, if you have a problem with your health, what do you do? You go to doctors. Well, it's a complicated problem. Well, then I go to the better doctors you know, and uh, the more important doctors. Well, it's because it's your health. You have, you have a problem in your business and you're losing money and maybe somebody's stealing or maybe you're not getting the best products or whatever. Well, I hire experts and I have an investigation. Okay, now, are you aware that there are people who believe in God? Oh, sure, I know about them. Are you aware that some of them have PhDs? Are you aware that some of them are professors in universities? And if that's not your taste, 
Are you aware that some of them are very rich? <laughs> so they do very good in business? So they must be pretty smart, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess there are. Well, then, are you sure you're right to oppose God and oppose religion? Are you sure you're right? How do you know you're right? Did you check out what they have to say? No? Maybe you're making a big mistake. Because there is a God, and he's running the world and has plans for the world. You're on the wrong train. Going the opposite direction. Don't you think you should check it out? If you had a question about your health, you would check it out. Question about your business, you would check it out. Why aren't you checking this out? And if he doesn't have a good answer, then you can accuse him of internal inconsistency. Not that there are external facts which would require something, but you can, uh, you can charge him on, uh, uh, with external inconsist internal inconsistency. The same argument can be used with respect to deniers of the Holocaust. But there are so many survivors, they're telling lies, they get benefit out of it, they're, they're, they get uh, monetary compensation. The Germans ex even admitted it because they lost the war, they had no choice but to admit it, uh, you know, the victor sets the terms, and so on and so on. Whatever you say, he has millions, who counted them up, who has a list. Uh, the, the, the Jews who were in the camps were starved and beaten and, 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 and disoriented. You can't trust their testimony. He has all of these excuses. So he doesn't believe in the Holocaust. Ask him, do you believe in the American Civil War? Do you believe that America put people on the moon? How much evidence do you have for that? American Civil War? And it was 100, 180 years ago. You don't know anybody who died, who lived then, who died then. So, why are you? Why do you believe in that? Why is your evidence for the American Civil War superior to your evidence for the Holocaust? And if you can't answer that question, then you've convicted him of internal inconsistency, which is a conviction of prejudice. He's do, what he's doing on the basis of prejudice. And if he tells you. Oh, listen, the evidence for the, for the Holocaust is Jewish evidence, and therefore it's not trustworthy. So first of all, as I said before, it isn't. But then you ask him, well, how do you know that Jewish evidence is, is not trustworthy? Where do you have cases where the Jews said something and you know with external neutral information that it's wrong? Let's see. And then you convict them of prejudice on that. So um, that's one way that you could make the person... Uh, 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 could, could accuse him of, of guilt. But I, I do think that if, if, you know, if uh, people are allergic to this idea, they're really very upset with this idea. So let me, let me try to make, give you an a, a really uh, sharp example. Let's suppose a four-year-old child in Gaza throws a stone at a Jew. Would you call him evil and wicked? Would you try to shoot him? Four-year-old child? Okay, he's doing it because his parents said that that's what you should do. So it's very hard to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to say that just the action should, should make the person um, evil in that way. But, of course, the, the ferocity and those who get benefit out of it, uh, there's no question that, the, that they represent evil in the world. Okay, so, so that's the, that's the uh, now I want to just point out one last thing. Uh, people quote this, this verse all the time, when your enemy falls, don't rejoice. It's definitely very noble, and it's uh, definitely, you should work on that, that, that consciousness, but they don't often quote the end of the verse. The end of the verse is, don't, Rejoice when your enemy falls, lest God turn away his anger from your enemy. Oh, that's why? Listen, he's my enemy. So I don't want him to be successful. Right? But if I rejoice when he falls, why is he falling? Well, because God's pushing him down. That's why people fall. And if I rejoice when he's, when he's falling, God will pick him up again. Don't be stupid. <laughs> Don't rejoice. And I'm not saying it that way just because I'm making it up. There's a story in the Gemara. Rava was ill. 
So he told his servant on the first day, don't tell anybody that I'm ill. And the second day, go out to the shuk, go out to the marketplace, and make an announcement that I'm ill. Because those people who love me will pray that, I, that God should, should uh, cure me. And those people who hate me will rejoice. And when the people who hate me rejoice, God will cure me because of their rejoicing. That's what the verse says. It says when you rejoice over your enemies falling, God will pick him up and won't fall anymore. So Rava was taking very seriously the end of the verse. So I think we have, to, we have to read it both ways. We have to read it that there's a danger for ourselves, for our own spiritual balance and identity, if we hate people who, who are our enemies just because they're our enemies. Um, and also to know that uh, if we descend to that kind of self-centered view of the world, self-centered definition of what's important or unimportant in the world, then we're going to be hurting ourselves as well. That, that, that's, that's certainly true. Anyway, this is the example of this, um, uh, this person who was killed. And as we say in Hebrew, Cain Yirbu, may they multiply for these, uh, these evil people who are, who are killed. Uh, I cert say certain psalms every day because of certain things that I'm involved in. The last word I was saying this morning, who Yavus Tsarenu, he will, uh, Yavus is like to cut the ground from under uh, those who, who hurt us, those who, uh, who attack us. So those are things which we, which we pray for. We pray for it, but we have to know that we're praying on behalf of what God wants for the world. Yeah. Um, this is kind of, kind of a separate question. I don't know if this is coming through. Yeah. Um, so this this is there's I don't know exactly where where I read it, but there's this there's this idea that that angels shouldn't be praised for for how great they are and how they don't have any shortcomings and they're, they're not angry or they, they don't want to smite people. Um, do, could that idea also be applied to belief in in God and and that? It really, if every and, and really with even within the Jew, just just Jewish people, that if everyone were were believing in God and following all the mitzvahs, that there would really be no reward for following all the mitzvahs because everyone, it, it would be like commonplace. There's no there's no nothing pulling you away. Everybody's doing the mitzvahs. Well, first of all, I don't think that's that's psychologically true, um, especially since. There are a lot of things that you do where nobody's present. Mm. And then the fact that everybody's doing something else would not stop you from doing things that you do when you're alone. And it certainly wouldn't affect your ideas. And the Torah wants you to have certain ideas and not, and not others, or your, or your inner emotional experience, which the Torah wants, and nobody has to know, you know what's going on inside. So I don't think that would, that would cover all of the mitzvahs, number one. And, um, you're right that, as we mentioned before, the, more, more, the extent to which you have to make an effort to do something is one dimension of reward. The harder it is, the more reward you get, generally, although there are exceptions, but that's, that's, that's generally true. So there will be less reward when it's, when it's um, easier to do. But um, the fact that you know the truth with absolute clarity does not mean that you can't rebel. And the proof of it is Jonah, who was a prophet. And God said, go to Nineveh. And as soon as the prophetic vision was over, he booked passage to Tarshish, saying, I'm not going there. So the fact that he had prophecy did not take away his free will. The free will is much more powerful and much freer from influence than people imagine. Um, even if everybody's doing the mitzvahs, what about envy? Somebody else's circumstances of life is superior to mine. Um, I, I, why would that stop me from envying him? There are a lot of mitzvahs that, that could, be, could be compromised, even though uh, everybody's putting on tefillin in the morning. Though putting on tefillin will have less impact than... Uh, there still be spiritual challenges and still be an opportunity for spiritual failures. Okay. Uh.